This is Neil Pastoricha, and welcome, or welcome back, to chapter 48 of Three Books. Yeah, you know, when we composed that music, I say we, but it wasn't me, it was Roberta Ercoli. I hired a classical musician to compose that music for Three Books. I said to him, I want it to be music I never get sick of, that feels timeless, that feels complex and beautiful, and has an analog twist to it. Which is why the very beginning of that music is the stop and record, or sorry, the play and record buttons of an old tape recorder. And why we let that music roll for like 45 seconds. This ain't no five second jingle jangle. No ads at the front of the show. No ads during the show. No ads or sponsors at all. No little mic drop moment of a little sound bite. I'm not trying to hook your attention here. If you're listening, it means you're in. It means you're, you're here. You've spent that 45 seconds centering yourself, grounding yourself, and opening your mind up to have a conversation. Every single chapter of three books should feel like a conversation, and you are in the middle of that conversation. That's why during the show, I come out of your left ear and the guest comes out of your right. Yes, we had feedback that people don't like that, so we've produced it a little bit, so I come out mostly of your left ear and a little bit out of your right, and the guest comes out mostly in your right ear and a little bit in your left just so that it's not too crazy sounding, but it still lets you feel like you're in the middle of the conversation. Three Books is our epic 14-year-long quest to count down the world's 1,000 most formative books, three books at a time. We are talking to people like Sarah Anderson over in Chapter 8, the author and creator of the phenomenal Sarah's Scribbles, Cartoons, and Books. Over in chapter 19, we're flying all the way over to Vancouver, British Columbia, sitting down in the Yale Town District of Vancouver with none other than Mr. Chip Wilson, the founder of Lululemon. And we're hanging out with people like Dr. Laura Markham. You may have heard that a couple chapters ago in chapter 46, where we hung out in her brownstone in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Dr. Laura Markham, of course, is the author of Peaceful Parent, Happy Kids, a couple other books, and the founder of AHA Parenting a website, and a newsletter that my wife, Leslie, and I religiously read every single week. So, we've been bouncing around. And where are we going this time? Well, for Chapter 48, released February 23rd, 2020, 10.32 a.m. on the exact minute of the new moon. Happy new moon, everybody. We're going to hang out with none other than the Mr., the Mr., yes, the Mr., Michael Bungay Stanier. Mr. Bungay Stanier, how does Michael Bungay Stanier describe himself in his own Amazon.com biography? Well, let me read it. Michael was banned from his high school graduation for the balloon incident. He was sued by one of his law school lecturers for defamation. Gave himself a concussion, digging a hole one day as a laborer. He was fired on his first shift as a garage attendant. And he has held a number of jobs where he had little to no impact. We could end there, uh, and you might listen, or you might not, and we do talk about that biography in this chapter, so you'll hear what we say about it and why he writes his biography that way. But Michael's also more impressive in a number of other ways. He's a native of Australia. Got a couple letters recently saying, hey, we want a little bit non-English, non-Anglophone speakers, and I was thinking to myself, hey, here's one, but then I realized in Australia they speak English, just slangy English, so he's got a slang, he's got slangy English, I hope that's a little bit non-Anglophone, but we're getting there, we're getting there, we're moving there. He goes over to Oxford. Why? To do his Rhodes Scholarship. The guy's a Rhodes Scholar. How did he get a Rhodes Scholar? You're going to hear a fascinating tale about that in this chapter. Who does he meet there? Uh, A beautiful woman who he falls in love with. And it so happens that she's Canadian. So when they decide to tie the knot, he's like, well, I guess we're going to have to go to Australia or Canada. Um, Well, how about Canada? (laughs) So he moves to Toronto, Canada. I'm so thrilled and fortunate that he did. Because 10 years ago, Michael and I formed a virtual friendship. We met through Chris Gillibo. Again, you'll also hear about that on the show. I did his podcast at the time, which was the Do More Great Work podcast. And I finally called in the favor to have him back over on Three Books. What has he been up to in Toronto for the last kind of 20 years? Well, he founded a company called Box of Crowns, a company that helps organizations do less good work and more great work. At Box of Crowns, Michael and his team of facilitators, it's a huge, 
company with all these facilities and all these different organizations around the world. It's a fascinating company. If you're interested in getting more coaching, I highly recommend that. I've worked with Michael and his team. I've seen some of the coaching stuff that they've done in practice and seen them on the stage. This guy's awesome. What do they do? They teach 10-minute coaching strategies so busy managers build stronger teams and get better results. Okay, awesome. How does he know how to do this? Well, he's been recognized as one of the coaches of the year uh, by a number. He's won a dump, number of different awards on his coaching strategy. You're going to hear some of that in this chapter. And he's written a book called The Coaching Habit. Say less, ask more, and change the way you lead forever. As I record this introduction, that book currently has 2,081 reviews on Amazon. It came out four years ago, and it's still hanging out in the top 1,000 of overall books in the world. That's a phenomenal accomplishment for a book that was self-published, published by none other than Jesse Finkelstein of Page Two Publishing, a former guest on three books, and has been driven and grown because it's a viral hit sensation. It's a book people love, and they can't help but buying and sharing with everybody. That's not Michael's own, only book, though. As I record this, again, he's just about to release the follow-up to The Coaching Habit called The Advice Trap. The subheadline on this one is, be humble, stay curious, and change the way you lead forever. This chapter of three books is being released on February 23rd, and Michael's new book, The Advice Trap, comes out on February. February? February? Oh my God, I don't want to be a February person. That's like almost as bad as a library person or a nuclear person. No judgment on three books. That's one of our one of our values, a no book shame, no book guilt. We can't judge, but still, the word is February. I got to get it right. It comes out, his book, on February 29th. I did it again. February 29th, 2020. Oh, my gosh. I can't say February. February. Oh. <laughs> so for this chapter, chapter 48, uh, I recorded at the end of the summer. So you're going to hear, like, you're going to hear the end of the summer in this recording. We go to Michael's porch in the Roncesvalles neighborhood of Toronto. We sit and hang out on his porch in a couple, like, folding kind of lawn chairs. And we talk about, of course, his three most formative books. But of course, you don't know Michael Bungay Sr. yet, but you're about to get to know him, or maybe you do know him and you're, you're excited to hear him again. But for those that don't know him, Michael's mind is like a box that you open. Hey, I was about to say it's like a box of crowns. It's like a box you open and a whole bunch of springs fly out in all directions. You will hear what I mean as soon as you hear him start to talk. So what are some other things we discussed? Well, things like what gives us civilization on the planet? How do we develop the skill to be translators? How do we make complex things simple? This is one of Michael's greatest gifts, and you'll hear it hinted at in some of his books. How do you actually think about maximizing your tiny short life? When should you zig when others zag? And when and how should you provoke curiosity rather than create certainty? I love Michael Bungay Stanier. He is one of the most fascinating minds in my life. I feel so grateful and honored to call him a friend, and I hope you fall in love with him too. Now, shall we? Let's get into it, people. It's time to head on down to Michael's front porch and have a conversation for Chapter 48. Let's go. Hey, just Michael. keep pressing the button. <laughs> just keep pressing buttons until eventually it, it turns red. Uh, and uh, and then something explodes. And then something explodes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sitting that's here. Just, that's Donald Trump's approach to being a president. <laughs> if he's going to keep people pressing people's buttons, something's going to turn red and explode. <laughs> we should probably not put that in the podcast. We're obsessed with with pressing buttons. As a, as a as a why, why is that? It, it can't be evolutionary. There was no buttons. That's true. There's no primal uh, or, thing. Or maybe that's what accelerated humankind. You know, there was this like, people put the wheel down as like the great invention that moved us on, but actually somebody invented the button <laughs> and somebody went, I've got to hit, I've got to press that fucking button and I've got to do that now. Well, I mean, And then they're like, we need more buttons and we need, okay, so somebody invented a car. Yeah. So there are buttons on the car and then it's just gone from there. Uh, Industrial age is down to somebody going, I need some machines to attach buttons onto them so I can press buttons. You're so right about that. I mean, I remember Staples, I believe. Yeah, they have a button where you just hit it's, the, you it's buy a button. A, it's used by a button. It, it says, that was easy. <laughs> yeah, you hit exactly. this button. And, and I think I remember hearing or reading somewhere that it's like their number one top-selling SKU of all time. I know, it's ridiculous. Oh, my gosh. Well, Michael, I, I um, 
you and I have known each other for a long time, but we've never sat here. So um, should I or do you want to just describe the scene for those listening who can't see what I'm seeing right here? So I'm in my personal graveyard. So surrounding me, it's, it's like my vault. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. A I don't tomb. know where that came from. It's been a long <laughs> week. Um, so I live in Toronto, downtown Toronto, kind of inner West End, uh, the Roncesvalles High Park area. And uh, we, my wife and I rent this apartment. Um, and one of the lovely things about it is, is a front patio deck piece. So we're up on the first floor, yep. uh, what Australians would call the second floor, because in Australia they number the, the floors one, two, three, four, not ground one, two, three, four. So for your international audience, I'm just giving. Sir, that. what floor are we? I walked upstairs, so I think so I'm on the second floor. No, we're on. We're on the. There's the ground floor. Yeah, and then there's the first floor. That's where we're at. We're on, did you call this the first floor? Yeah, I think so. Oh, and then the. The third floor above us is what you call I the could, second? I think so. Okay, well. Now I'm, I'm confused. No, no. I, anyway. I, and there's no well, fourth floor, obviously, because it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a bad number in Chinese culture, so you wouldn't. Uh, That's right. Yeah, so you wouldn't put a fourth Although, floor. Have on. you ever understood how, you know how in hotels, when you're in an elevator, there's no 13 button? Yeah. They go from 12 to 14. Exactly. And if you're on the 14th floor, it is actually the 13th of floor. Of course, yeah. So you're like. If it's unlucky, it's you're going to be a, unlucky. It's just a mind that. game. It is such a mind game. Anyway, <laughs> we are on we are on our front deck. We've had a we've had a kind of a weird we've had a weird summer, but this is actually almost a lovely day. It's a little hot. It's a little sticky, but there's a bit of a breeze. Uh, Roncesvalles. We're right close to Roncesvalles, which is kind of the main cool little street. But Marion Street, my street, is pretty gentle. There's a little bit of traffic, but not much. Basically. You know, and I also love the fact that I'm surrounded by there's a hammock out here. Yeah. I'm on these, we're all sitting in these green wicker chairs, the two of us. Yeah. We got this green um, kind of table in between us. I think this is the first ever outdoor chapter of three books. I'm I pretty thought, sure. Did, what, didn't you have a chat with somebody in San Diego when you were on a patio? Like one of the very first episodes. Chap oh, yeah. You know what? You're right. Chapter two of the show with Frank Warren was in my hotel room, oh, uh, but okay. it was on the balcony. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you, you for reminding me <laughs> of my own uh, settings uh, on, on the show. Come That's on, really man, step up. <laughs> I actually even uh, yeah okay thank you so this is the, this like I was saying this is the second ever uh, chapter of three books that's taking place in an outdoor right. setting but the first one uh, on the um the the raised ground floor yeah of exactly. your house okay um and so there's there's little plants and there's some there's some Christmas lights yeah and I think people not already... Christmas lights they're just lights because oh. we keep we keep them up and on going all year round because we think they're awesome <laughs> like who doesn't need a bit more sparkliness in their life so my wife Leslie keeps our lights on way after Christmas. Yeah. And I'm like, Les, it's like February. Like, don't you think you turn them off? He's like, no, no. She's like, I don't turn them off till the weather's nice enough to take them down. I'm like, just because well, they're up doesn't mean they have to stay on. I'm tell confused her, by tell this. Tell her to step up her game. And it's like, why are you taking them down when the weather's nice? Oh, you just... Why wouldn't you want a little sparkly illumination in the joy of summer mm. and spring and mm. fall? Sparkly illumination. Yeah, we don't have enough of that. In life. So you, you actually light these all year. Yeah, are you, you're the one house on the street. We are the one house on the street. Who has the Christmas lights up all year round? Sorry, exactly. the, the the sort of the, non the, the non Christmas non, the lights. nominal holiday lights yes. up all year round. And sometimes it's you know you're all this. I'm sure people on the street are thinking like it's my birthday, it's Chinese New Year, it's like oh it's, he, he or, remembered or who, Ramadan. Who are these people? <laughs> I think that's mostly what they're thinking. It's like seriously, how lazy are these people that they can't even take the holiday lights up or down? That is funny. I I I so appreciate this. And here you know it's it's um. I don't know if you remember this, Michael, but almost but certainly not. You you actually emailed me on January sixteenth, two thousand and eleven. Oh, I remember that like it was yesterday. <laughs> no, funny I, I'm going to read you the email. I'm going to read you an email. I'm going to read you the email. The subject line is "Great missing, great meeting you at Chris G's." Chris Gillibo. Chris Gillibo. Yeah. So we must have both gone to one of his book events. Or, oh, yeah, it was because on his first tour, Chris came into town. I knew Chris a little bit. And he'd ask you to introduce him. It was the Art of Nonconformity. It was the Art of Nonconformity. Right? And I was in the audience and honestly slightly annoyed that I wasn't being asked to in, in, introduce him. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm not Neil Pezzarica. The, oh, I just dash off several million, billion selling books before I'm 12. So, <laughs> so anyway. 12. So, so, I, so, you, so you hit me the next day. I, yeah, we must I, have met I, there. I wasn't really happy to meet you. I was, I was, I was envious about meeting you. <laughs> well, you said you lied in your email because you said it was a pleasure and congratulations on all the good things that seem to be happening for you. Oh, interesting. Seem to be happening yeah. for you right now. 
and for an excellent TED Talk. We've talked about doing a short podcast interview, part of my great work interview series. Yeah. I can certainly time things to support your new book. Um, how does that sound? With best wishes, Michael. Yeah. P.S. Knowing your love of awesome, you might enjoy the eight irresistible principles of fun. Yeah. Um, so a few things pop out to me in this, in this email. Anything pop out to you before I yeah, go in? Yeah, because, I mean, if you, his, his, yeah, it's, his, really, it's really small. His, here's the subtext. <laughs> the, the subtext is... Um, is, that where, is that the very oh, top? Oh, right, but I, it's like two-point like, font. Yeah. So it's like, hey, Neil, it wasn't really a pleasure meeting you, but I'm sucking <laughs> up to you because I think you're quite an influential guy. <laughs> Your TED Talk was okay. <laughs> I reckon I could do a better TED Talk, but they haven't invited me. <laughs> Am I bitter? Yeah, I'm bitter about that. They still haven't invited me to give a TED Talk. You've done, what, 72 TED Talks now or something ridiculous? We talked about a short podcast interview, blah, blah, blah. I can, cer I can certainly time things to support the new book. So I'm like, it's, it's as good. I, I'm doing this for you rather than for me. <laughs> uh, we can also do whatever, blah, 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 blah. You've How does that sound? I, you, I, and I cut off the P.S. Yeah. Well, the P.S. is your ear. Ir Knowing your love of awesome, you might like the eight irresistible. So eight irresistible. Your, your viral video. Yeah. Um, very first kind of piece of IP, intellectual property I created was called The Eight Irresistible Principles of Fun, which was created under pressure because I was giving a talk about how people should create intellectual property to the local coaching chapter here. And then went, I don't actually have any intellectual property of my own yet. So maybe I should do something about that. So it took me about five minutes to create this thing and people loved it yeah and then we turned it into a I video watched it last night it's slow isn't it <laughs> it's like it's like a six minute video well we're a decade out and the whole world is sped up it, 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 it it's that's what's telling for me because i watch that now and it's it's cute and it's well animated and stuff and it was really cutting edge and a little too fast a decade ago and um and now you watch it and you're like oh my goodness can we not just to access and watch this quickly. Everyone's doing that now. Yeah. You know, I was talking to David Sedaris about, do you listen to your audiobooks on 1.5 or 2? He's like, I don't want to hear books read by a chipmunk. Yeah. You know? Um, but by the way, the reason I mentioned that whole email you sent to me years ago was because I'm finally cashing in my return <laughs> paycheck. You asked me go. to do a podcast. There we go. You know, back in 2011. And finally, I've asked you to do one back and you've said, yeah. So this is really just, you know, a reciprocity um, I'm only of... doing this because I'm thinking this is the way I get a TED talk. <laughs> if if I'm wrong about that, we can just cut this. I can just list the three have books you and then we're on done. TED .com? Uh, once or twice I have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cut to scene of every single day, Michael submitting an application Hi. on TED.com. Yeah. Um, okay, well, well, Michael, just just to tell people out, like, what do you do? <sighs> Nobody really knows. I'm not sure I truly know, but here's the here's the formal. This. I am the founder of a company called Boxer Crowns. Uh, we are a company that believe we're, we're trying to be the foremost company championing coaching to drive leadership development and culture change in organizational life. So we're about creating practical coaching skills for busy managers and busy leaders. So what is coaching? Oh, see, that's an impossible question to ask. Okay, so coach, many people have heard of coaches or coaching. You wrote a book called The Coaching Habit. The Coaching Habit, Habit exactly, uh, which, which has been a great book for us, sold half a million copies, which means that in this particular company, it, would be one of, it may be one of the top 10 selling books because I think you've got at least 12 books that have sold more than a million copies. So, um, but yeah, the coaching habit. <laughs> I didn't follow that joke at all I, until I finally understood was, it. Wasn't that funny? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what is coaching? So coaching for us is a way of showing up with somebody, seeing them as a human being, and in the end, staying curious a little bit longer and running to advice giving and getting stuff done a little bit more slowly. And in organizational life in particular, people are very much about, let me tell you what to do. Let's get this stuff done. And for us, we think, having people be more coach-like, being more curious is a really powerful tool to show up as a more effective leader. And how, how do people do that? Well, um, they build a habit to ask a few good questions. It's as simple and as difficult as that. What are the two or three best questions you'd share with us? Well, um, you know, it depends. In the book, The Coaching Habit, I say, look, seven good questions. 
And when people go, so that's what, why I asked for two or three. Yeah, I know. So when people go, well, what's your favorite question? I'm like, ah, you know, it took me three years to narrow it down to seven. It's pretty hard to then go, you know, here's my here's the world's my moved thing. faster. Uh, ah, we don't okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what are my favorite questions? Uh, so there's one I talk about as the best coaching question in the world, A W E. Uh, so awesome. Uh, and it uh, is, and what else? And what else? Because question the f- mark. Question mark. Because the first answer somebody gives you to any question is never their only answer, and it's rarely their best answer. And secondly, it's a self-management tool. If what we're trying to do is have people stay curious a little bit longer, and what people are doing is battling their advice monster, their deep <laughs> desire to tell people what to do, then and what else is a way of staying Focus, staying curious a little bit longer for more effect. Cool. I love that. Yeah. You taught me that, and I have been uh, noticing that I don't do it. Well, it's probably a good thing. I mean, your podcast would be four hours long rather than two hours long if you kept asking, and what else? So I think your listening audience is delighted that, that you're not using that as, as much as, as you might. Uh, I have been, Some people do say that the three books chapters are going too long. Other people say... Hey, I, li- I also get emails from people saying, hey, I listened to like seven in a row on like a long drive. And I'm like, well, I guess I should have made them longer. So who knows? Who knows? Um, but I like them to be whatever length they are. And so now you have very graciously sent me three books that you are willing to talk about mm-hmm. on this show. They will form three of the top 1,000 books that we're putting together between 2018 and 2031. <laughs> Which of these three books would you like to begin with? Just point at it. And then I'd love to just do 30 seconds for the people that um, are listening who have not heard of the book, uh, which is probably, yeah. you know, including me, most most of us, and then uh, and then ask you to tell us a bit about it. Right, let's, let's start with that one, okay. because okay. I'm going to be your first guest that that denies the choice of his own book before he... Oh, that's great. Okay, good. So the, your first book is If on a Winter's Night, A Traveler by Italo Calvino. Yeah. Uh, Italo Calvino is an Italian author who lived from 1923 to 1985. Yeah. Uh, if, on a win- if on a Winter's Night a Traveler was published in 1979, uh, and it's a postmodernist novel told in the form of a frame story about the reader trying to read a book called If On a Winter's Night, A Traveler. <laughs> so, Which is one of the least compelling pictures for a book ever. <laughs> it's, a, it's a totally meta. So this every is chapter totally meta. is divided into two... Every chapter of the book is divided into two sections. The first section of each chapter is in second person, where you are describing... Uh, are described to be read, attempting to read the next chapter of this book that you are reading. Yeah. The second half is the first part of a new book that you find. The second half is always about something different <laughs> than the previous chapter, and the ending is never explained. <laughs> the book was published in an English translation by William Weaver in 1981. I found this book compelling and incredibly frustrating, and <laughs> yeah. I read the last chapter before I got halfway through the middle. Yeah. And please, Michael, if you could, tell us about your relationship with If on a Winter's Night, A Traveler by Italo Calvino. So here's one of the the, I'm going to read a section from it because it's like one of my all-time favorite sections of a book ever. And I think it's going to really appeal to this audience because everybody here is a reader. Everybody here loves books. Um, so blah, blah, blah. You went into a bookstore and you're looking for the book if on a winner's night a traveler. Now, I don't know if you noticed. This is one of the quirks. I don't know what it means exactly. But on the title of the book, Traveler is spelled with two L's. Oh, and then when you open the book and they start talking about you're trying to buy a book called If on a Winner's Night a Traveler, it's spelled with one L. I didn't notice that. Exactly. This is called postmodern weirdness. Anyway, so in the shop window, you have promptly identified the cover with the title you were looking for. Following this visual tray, you have forced your way through the shop past the thick barricade of books you haven't read, which were frowning at you from the tables and shelves trying to cow you. But you know you must never allow yourself to be awed that among them there extend for acres and acres the, and these are all capital letters, the books you needn't read, the books made for purposes other than reading, books read even before you open them since they belong to the category of books read before being written. And thus you pass the outer girdles of ramparts. But then you're attacked by the infantry of the books that if you had more than one life you would certainly also read, but unfortunately your days are numbered. With a rapid maneuver, you bypass them and move on to the phalanxes of the books you mean to read, but there are others you must read first. The book's too expensive now, and you'll wait till they're remi- reminded, uh, remainded. 
The book's ditto, too expensive now, but you'll read when they come out in paper book. Books you can borrow from somebody, books that everybody's read, so it's as if you had read them too. And it goes on for a bit like this. And I'm just like, wow. oh, my God, that explains every book, every bookshelf ex- store experience I've ever had. Totally. Going, ah, I should read, I should, you know, I should read Moby Dick. But ever, I mean, nobody ever has read Moby Dick, or nobody cares about it anymore. So maybe I, maybe I can just pretend I've read Moby Dick. It's a, it's a whale, right? It's a white right. whale. Call me Ahab. Yeah, I'm, I've got it. That's all I need. <laughs> so, and the book is written like a choose your own adventure. You are the character, and the books are looking for a book called If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. Right. What is up with this book? So I, for me, so I've got a. This will be a theme that comes through the book. There's a. There's a. I, I love people who are clever with language and clever with structure. There's something really fantastic about that. And really, you know, in the work I do, which is often about building learning for people, what I've come to learn is that content is often subservient to structure and the arc and the design. And so often um, when you read a really great book, what you're actually reading is something that's gone through enough iterations that an elegant structure has appeared. But you have to kind of be aware of that. You have to kind of, writers know this, readers maybe not always know that. So for me, this is a book that kind of just showed me the act of reading. So in the same way, emotional intelligence is when you, you understand that you are reacting emotionally and you get to see how you're reacting. And then you get to choose if that's serving you or you want to do things differently. So an emotional intelligence gives you a meta view and therefore choices about how you show up in the world. This is like emotional intelligence for readers. It shows you how books are written. It shows you how tropes are put into books. And therefore it gives you an opportunity to go, this allows me to be conscious of my reading as I'm reading and wow. make choices about how I want to, how I want to engage with the book. Now, I, like, I'm with you, which is like, I find it actually hard to get through all of this because after I get a bit too clever and a bit too kind of, all right, I, you could have probably done this in 79 pages, not 279 yeah. pages. Yeah. And in fact, the book I really meant to mention to you is another Italo Covino book called Invisible Cities. What do you mean meant to mention? Well, you know, you told me, like, what are your favorite three books? And No, I, I didn't say favorite. I, formative. Formative three books. Yeah. So, um, thank you. Um, and Invisible Cities. <laughs> which you're now which, holding. Which I'm now replacing, holding. Replacing uh, If on a Winter's and you can Traveler. And you can see how long I've had these because you can see how yellowed all the pages are and it's got that kind of... That's the one. The I pa- read the wrong book. This keeps no. happening to me. The, how with Frank Warren, I read the wrong Hard Times. I saw that. That was hilarious. Now I've read the wrong... To, to be fair, the Frank Warner thing, that is because you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one, it's because I'm an idiot because I didn't. I told you the wrong, the wrong title. So what is up? So tell us about this book then. So I just want to close on, on if on a winter's night a traveler like yeah. David Mitchell, um, I love who I love David Mitchell, you know, author of Cloud Atlas, yeah, brilliant, and uh, a, a lot of other amazing novels. He said he loved the book when he was young; it took his breath away. However, uh, he didn't like it as much when he got older. And he has this quote: "He's saying, however breathtakingly inventive a book is, it is only breathtakingly inventive once, with once being better than never." Yeah, I buy, I, I buy that. I totally buy that. And one of the things that I, as I was thinking about you coming over, I'm like, why are these books formative for me? Uh, It's the connection between head and heart. Mm -hmm. Because if it's just clever, then once you've seen the cleverness, you've seen it. But if it's kind of engages you emotionally, then there's a way that you can come back to it and read it again and again, because it, it moves you more than just going, that's a, that's a clever idea. So the first time I read that, I just I still remember reading. I can't even tell you exactly where it was. It feels like I was in, like, uh, my final year at high school, and just reading this and just going, "This is my head exploding," just because it was so in, in, inventive and so new to me. The first kind of access to post. You said it tur- and it turn, turned you on to reading, as you say. It didn't turn me on to it, it. I mean, I've always been a huge reader. I've loved reading all my life. I could read from an early age. I could read fast from an early age, but it was it was the thing that disrupted my reading and taught me to be um, to read in a more uh, intelligent way, and a kind of like I'm thinking about how I'm reading, not just what I'm reading. 
Um, how do we do that for people? Uh, I, the number one thing I hear uh, doing this show is uh, I want to read more. Yeah. I don't have time to read. Or I heard this this morning. Uh, I have three boys. They don't read. Yeah. I like them to read. We want our kids to read more. Yeah. You said you read from a young age. You read fast from a young age. This created more awareness around your reading. Yeah. What are some of the ways we help people read more? You know, I'm, I'm the wrong person to ask for this because it's like asking a really good sportsman to coach somebody. They're like, I don't know. It just came to me. Like, my, I, I was a terrible first child because both my brothers have uh, a, a, a cross dominance or some sort of form of dyslexia. So for them, both of them, it was a bit of a struggle to read. They're both big readers now, but it wasn't a, an early joy. For me, I'm just like, I have never not read. <laughs> you, know, I'm, you know, I was like, I remember at the age of like nine, I was like at four o'clock in the afternoon, I started, I started to reread Lord of the Rings. And I read the I read the entire three book series without stopping. You know, I read for like sixteen hours without a break, uh, and I'd read it before, so I knew what was happening. And I'm a fast reader, and I probably skipped a bunch of the long Elvish songs because <laughs> you know they're undigestible. But but you know that was me. I was like nobody had to get me to read. I mean, walking in here, I just walked by piles and piles and piles of books and they all have, it's not just like everybody else's, you know, it's not like you're a hoarder with just piles of books. You've actually categorized and labeled them all. You have things like, this is for idea generation. This is yeah. for creativity. This is for business improvement. And I'm very confident you will read all of those books. I know you, you I'm, are, you just, I'm you devour sure. books. <laughs> I'm glad you're confident. Um, I'm, I'm excited to get to some of them. I'm, a lot of those are business books. And honestly, I read business books with a pretty critical eye. I come with an assumption that most of them are going to be terrible. So I will, I will get into them and I'm like, you've got a little while to impress me. And if you're not impressed, we've got a little library down the end of the street. You know, one of these little yeah, boxes yeah, totally. on, a, on a thing. And I'm, I put a lot of books into that um, and put it out into the world. But get a book that can really grab you in your head and your heart. Not many do that. And this, but this other Italo Calvino book. Yeah, did. Invisible so, Cities. So yeah. it is a short book. It's like 120 pages. And Calvino is brilliant for his ability to structure. I pulled out another one of his books called The. Um, oh, here it is. The, uh, the Castle Across Destinies. So to give you a sense of how this is structured, he's taken the. And I'm just holding this up so Neil can see it. He's taken the tarot card oh, pack. Yeah and laid out the tarot card pack and then built stories across it and through it based on the based on how the tarot card pack is laid out based on his deep knowledge of folk tales and fairy tales and the like and it's so creative and so imaginative and so beautifully structured it's just fantastic huh um What's and invisible and, cities and invisible cities so the setup is this you have um kubla khan and Marco Polo. This is the framing device. Who are these people? So Marco Polo, uh, uh, Kublai Khan, the, the, I think the um, emperor of China. Um, Kublai Khan, the most famous explorer in the world. And um, they're, they're in, in Kublai Khan's palace. And Kublai Khan says, Marco Polo, tell me of the cities you've seen on your travels. And then what follows is these very short um, descriptions of cities. I mean, literally a page, uh, sometimes a paragraph, a half a page. And uh, this is going to be hard to describe, but they've all got titles. So there's cities and memory, cities and desire, city and signs, city, thin cities, trading cities, uh, cities and eyes, cities and the dead. And there's... Uh, uh, this is like this is this needs about a five and a half hour lecture, which <laughs> I'm not qualified to give. Um, but but what I love about this book is not only do you have the brilliance of the structure to it, and the sense that he's actually building it, the structure of the book actually almost kind of looks like a site skyscraper of, of a city, but each city is described so imaginatively and so perfectly and so beautifully. Each one is like a little gem of a city that doesn't exist, but feels like it could. Mm -hmm. So it's an, it, for me, it's, a, it's this breathtaking act of imagination. But it's also uh, a reminder that you can have, that 
that there's almost there's always more ways of looking at the world than just your own world. And there's a degree to uh, which some of the themes of the other two books are about understanding that sometimes the perspective from the edge and sometimes the different the different ways of looking at things is actually the the interesting way of looking at things. And uh, again, this is this is great that we're having this call because I was like, oh my goodness, I've I've heard I haven't listened to all of your interviews, but I've listened to most of them. I'm like, they're really interesting, articulate guests you've got. I'm in I'm in a world of pain here. But I was like, so why 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 did I say these were my formative books? Um, and you know, I'm a tall, straight, overeducated white man, so I have a pretty clear. You're not helping my diversity. Goals. I'm 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 terrible. <laughs> you know, I'm like I've got nothing going. You are, for me. however, the first ever road road scholar. We've True, on probably your first Australian. Um, yep. Probably the best looking guest you've ever had. Frank Warren, chapter two. Uh, topped only by chapter one, my wife, Leslie. Ah, there we go. Don't try to trap me here, Michael. I'm not. I'm, <laughs> yeah, your, your wife is beautiful. Um, uh, so there's something for me about the power of a diverse perspective and just and how that thing. And what I love about these cities, I'm like, oh, my goodness, I want to visit these cities. They don't even exist, but I want to visit these cities. And, yeah. Anyway. Well, Tim Ferriss is always going on and on about the barren and the trees. Yeah. The, the book where some guy goes up a tree and he doesn't come ever down. Yeah, which I've read and I like. I, I was completely underwhelmed by that book. <laughs> he loves it. I know he does. So Calvino. He, okay, you've added C-A-L-V-I-N-O, Calvino. I'll give you one other book of his. Okay. Um, it's called um, Six Memos for a New Millennial. Millennium. And it's a nonfiction book. It's actually kind of the text of lectures he was giving. Um, or preparing to give, he died before he finished them. So he only talked. He only talked. Got five out of the six written, but he talks about qualities that he thinks are important to the the new millennial uh, millennium, the, the quickness and lightness and some others I can't remember. But I just yeah. Part of what I love about him is he's he's got smarts. He's got a deep knowledge about the the heritage of writing, like he really understands the folk, the history of folk tales. And, and in Invisible Cities, out of all of his books, he brings a kind of poetic heart to it as well, which is why Invisible Cities is the book I should have got you to read. So who should read these books? I, you know, I'm not sure. What do you recommend I, them for, though? Well, I, I, I recommended Invisible Cities to one of my friends <laughs> a couple of years ago. He's yeah. like... I hate this book with a passion. Really? <laughs> I hate it. He just, he just disliked it. But I think from Visible Cities, um, the chapters read like little, little bits of prose poetry. So if you're like, the book I love has got a rollicking good plot and car chases, you're not going to like this book. If you're, if you're after beauty and imagination and poetry, then maybe this is, these are books, the Invisible Cities is a book you might like. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let's transition over to your second book, uh, A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. Yeah. Born in Des Moines, Iowa. Des Moines. Des Moines in 1951. Bill Bryson currently lives in England. Uh, a Short History of Nearly Everything came out from Broadway Books in 2004, and it is a popular science book that explains some areas of science usually using easily accessible language that appeals more so to the general public than many other books dedicated to science. A short history deviates from his popular travel books and instead describes things such as chemistry, paleontology, astronomy, and particle physics from the Big Bang all the way up to modern time. Tell us about your relationship with A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. You know, you're going to have to get better blurbs for these books because both the books I've suggested, actually, if you just read out that blurb, I'm like, yeah, I think I'll skip that book. It's not oh, that interesting. Does it sound good? It's from well, the back, isn't it? I, I, I'm not blaming you. I'm blaming the, the blurb writers. Okay, so why do I love this book? First of all... It sounds boring. It does sound boring. But, but it's not boring. It's an incredible book. It is an incredible book. I love this book. Um, have you read any other Bill Bryson books? No, just this. So just part of this. I... I oh, I'm... So it's really long. I, I feel betrayed by this that that. Comment. No, I only ever all promise I, to all read I them to try and read them. I, I oh. it's four hundred and seventy eight pages, and I read the first few chapters. Like this is really good. This is really good because it's like a tour guide yeah. through like the cosmos. Yeah. And then I went to the back. I said, "Do you ever do this?" And I'm like, "Oh, there's a really long index 
Oh, there's a really long bibliography. Oh, there's really long. And then I, I hold it in my hand yeah. and I'm like, oh, it's phew. Like a, it's it's a like, book. There's a hundred pages yeah. I don't have to read. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, I'm like looking at the middle part and I, I didn't quite get through the whole thing, yeah. but but um, so, it's great. It's great. The, the, so I came across Bill Bryson because of his travel writing and he's written books on uh, traveling around England, uh, books on traveling around Australia, walking the Pacific Northwest Trail. Yeah. And his writing is hysterical hysterical i remember being over at my in-laws um my wife is from nova scotia in canada and we're lying in bed um and uh obviously we're in the in-laws so there's no hanky panky going on there's kind of like a row of pillows down the the middle of the bed (laughs) but i'm um i'm reading one of his travel books i think the one about australia and i'm laughing so hard and I'm laughing quietly. I, I don't guffaw. I kind of shake. And it just makes the whole bed go, <laughs> my son and my wife is going, what are you doing? Look, lie on the floor because this is sounding all wrong to the in-laws as, as this as happens. <laughs> so this A book's so funny, your in-laws will think you're having, having sex. sex. Exactly. That's funny. Um, so his travel stuff is is mostly hilarious. I mean, not... His early books, absolutely breathtakingly funny, particularly England, particularly Australia. And then he was like, clearly going, well, I've done England, I've done Australia, I've done parts of America, I'm running out of places to go, and I probably don't want to get trapped in a rut here. So uh, he started moving into uh, more kind of general, popular, almost Malcolm Gladwell-esque style of writing. And his first version of that was this book, A Short History of Nearly Everything. And his premise is this. Most of us have been beaten to death by science in high school. We're like, wow, physics. Could it be any more life-sucking than the way it's currently being taught? Well, there's a car going the wrong way up our street. <laughs> it's all right. Someone's in a hideous car crash. Um, so, that, so, you know, it's like science can really kind of... And when you're learning science, you don't learn the color and the and the battles and the and the blood and the tears and the sweat of it. You learn formula. You're like, let me explain what momentum is. Yeah. And you're like, okay. F uh, equals M A. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Um and he's like, we've got to do better than that. So he he tackles science. He tackles all of science. So this is both universal and and necessarily incomplete. But the man has a gift for storytelling, an amazing gift for metaphor. I mean, his ability to to um, f- use metaphor is mind blowing, and the the impact for me, and this is kind of why I like this book beyond the intellectual because it kind of moves me, and I'm an intellectual guy. I'm more head than heart. So anything that connects to my heart, I'm like, that's pretty cool. Otherwise, it's a small wizened stone in my chest. Um, <laughs> I'm writing in wizened as a potential <laughs> word of the chapter. That's a good oh, one. That's right. Because you're, you're going for the alliterative. So I've got to come up with other cool W words <laughs> as part of the title of this. Um, the the bo- broad outcome from this is to make me go, it is a miracle and brilliant that I am alive right here, right now on this planet. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'll give you one example from the yeah. early chapters. So he goes, um, so we have a moon. I'm sure most of your readers know that. Um, But what they probably don't know or haven't really cottoned on to is how weirdly large our moon is compared to every other moon in our solar system. I mean, it's big. We have a really big moon. You know, they think, I mean, it's an aside, but I think it's some sort of like Mars-sized planet collided with Earth. It threw up all that stuff into the, the atmosphere and it clumped together and became our moon. If you look at the moons of Saturn or Jupiter, these are tiny little specks against these enormous planets. So everybody's listening is going, well, well done, Michael. You noticed that we had a big moon. Who cares? I'm like, so here's why we have civilization because of our moon. Our moon, it's so big, it really exerts a strong gravitational pull on the planet. And people know that already. That's why we have tides and the sea going up and down. But critically, it keeps our magnetic pole in place. So we have north and south. And it means that we have, uh, there's no kind of planetary wobble. The planet kind of revolves around a pretty steady pole. So what, you might ask? Well, 
What that means is that over the year we have consistent seasons. Winter, spring, summer, fall. Well, winter, whatever, fall. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we have consistent seasons. And I, well, that's delightful. So we get to go skiing, but what else? Well, if we didn't have consistent seasons, it would be basically impossible to have agriculture because agriculture relies on the growing site seasons, right? Course, you yeah. like you plant it in the spring, it grows in the summer, you harvest in the fall, you eat it in the winter and so on. And without agriculture, we wouldn't have, we have civilizations. We might be kind of tribes walking around hunting things, but you wouldn't be able to cultivate and grow, grow crops. And you're like, so basically civilization doesn't exist without a moon. I love that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love that. And then things like, it's another chapter, like we have tectonic plates. Okay. Everybody goes, yeah, I kind of remember tectonic plates from high school. There's big lumps of mantle floating on seas of lava. And that's why the mountains happen and kind of the earth looks like it kind of fit together as a jigsaw puzzle at one stage. Earthquakes are them rubbing against each other. Exactly. You got it. But so what? I mean, that's, that's interesting, but who cares? Uh, well, so if you didn't have tectonic plates, you wouldn't have mountains. And they're like, okay, so what? Well, it's like, here's the thing. If we didn't have mountains being newly formed, basically over the billions of years of the Earth's existence, uh, erosion would have just kind of worn the whole planet down to a flat surface, kind of like you see on other planets, right? Like Mars or, or the moon, it's basically flat. Again, so what? Well, because we are a water-based planet, the whole of the planet would be underwater. <laughs> so the whole of the planet's underwater. Like we, all, I, all I know is we wouldn't be having this podcast <laughs> if the planet had been underwater for the last you know, four billion years. So again, you're like, so he goes tectonic plates to going, and here's why you care about it because of civilization, or at least wow, that's the impact yeah. it had on me. Well, what an incredible view of, of, of gratitude. And um, the quote, that I picked out from the book that relates to this is talking about just your existence, mm -hmm. the, unlikely, the unlikeliness of your own existence. It says, he says from the book, not one of your pertinent ancestors was squashed, devoured, drowned, starved, stranded, stuck fast, untimely wounded, or otherwise deflected from its life's quest of delivering a tiny charge of genetic material to the right partner at the right moment in order to perpetuate the only possible sequence of hereditary combinations uh, that could result eventually, astoundingly, and all too briefly, in you. We are a, ri a ridiculously unlikely outcome. <laughs> it's, isn't it awesome? It is like, awesome. I, I'm it not a religious man. I am an atheist. But I, I don't think being an atheist means you can't be in awe of... The miracle of your life. Sometimes even maybe more so. Yeah, maybe. Well, because then you, you, you're you sort of saying, if it, like the cover of the book, it's a white book, and his name's in black at the top, Bill Bryson. It shows the picture of the earth in bubble wrap in a cardboard box, which I think is different than your cover, which is yeah. like my picture of the earth with an asterisk on the side of it. Yeah. yeah. But I thought the metaphor in my picture was, yeah. um, you know, this is a lucky and fragile thing yeah. that we get to be, be here. Yeah. And he does something that's really important in the world today, which is distilling vast amounts of information into a filtered, right. concise thing. And that seems to be like, if I look at popularity of like, wait, but why.com or the yeah. subtle art of not giving a fuck. It's like, these are people who aren't professing to have come up with the insight in the first place, but they're, rather they're translators. They're translators. Yeah. What's the future? Like, do we, is this a skill that we all kind of need to know how to do know how, and how do you develop this skill? It seems like in an ever expanding, yeah. not just universe, but in the information age, in, in the, the one of our values on the show is in an era of infinite choice, the value of curation skyrockets. Right. Yeah, I well, I, I mean, I think the popularity of the coaching habit book. I realized after listening to the Seth episode, I should have picked all three, all of my books as my top three books. So, you know, he's like, I'm <laughs> I'm picking my own book because I love my book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had that. a great conversation about that. I love you did that. Yeah, you're, you're referencing chapter three. Yep. Okay. Um, but um. One of the things that I'm good at, and I just, you know, through practice and through wiring or something, is finding simplicity on the other side of complexity. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this quote. Um, it's by, uh, gosh, one of, the, uh, one of the justices of the U.S. Supreme Court. And he says something on the lines of, the lines of, I don't give a fig for simplicity on this side of complexity, but I would give anything for simplicity on the other side of complexity. What does that mean, like simplicity on the other side of complexity? Well, I think when you read something that has an elegance and a power to it, 
It's gone through a process of editing and whittling through. This is your revealing the structure point from earlier. I think so. Yeah. Which is, and it, which is a, it, there is a way that when you're trying to understand profound things, it starts off being a kind of a brittle simplicity. And then as soon as you start trying to get into the reality of life, everything gets messy and complicated and complex. But if you work at it, you find an elegance. I mean, without trying to overly blow my own horn here, in the coaching habit, it's like there's seven questions. That's it. And people go, I love that there are just seven questions. Mm-hmm. How do you come up with well, the seven the questions? Well, even the book itself is tiny and small and short and not right. overwhelming. Like, And an early iteration of the book had like 169 questions. No way. And I'm like, here are my, all my favorite questions. There's so many awesome questions. And I wrote this book and it was just terrible. I mean, it was just an unreadable omnibus of questions. Yeah. And I'm like, that doesn't work. And then I spent, I, I probably spent a year writing out lists of questions is it five questions is it three questions and nine questions and there's just a lot of lot a lot of trying stuff out to go i think these are the seven best questions i can come up with and that willingness to work it's like work the dough and work the dough and work the dough or the clay or whatever the metaphor might be allows you to get to something really interesting how do you get there just time persistence effort editing as you call it i think it's um i think it's uh, editing and iterations. Um, I think that um, almost everything's going to get better the fourth time you write it. Wow. That is and, so interesting. And you know, because um, you know, you've written some brilliant stuff, but you know as the process of being a writer, by the time you're writing it for the fourth time, you kind of hate this book. You know, you're like, oh, I don't know if this is any good anymore. I don't know if I can write this. I've lost the point of this. <laughs> Why am I writing? What is this even about anymore? Who's who's reading? Who's going to read this? Nobody's ever going to read this. You're going to get yeah. into this slow of def- despond. But um, the willingness to go, if I worked it, if I didn't settle and I worked it through another time, where what, you know, how do you burnish it? How do you really polish it up to without over it? without messing it up? Right, because you can go too far. You totally can. And um, we talk. You know, you mentioned chapter three of the show with Seth Godin, and we actually talk about you on the show. I don't you know if do. you remember or not, because you gave me a simple metaphor on the other side of complexity. Because I was I was leaving Walmart at the time, and I was mm-hmm. like discombobulated and trying to figure out what I was going to do and how I was going to do it, and what I was going to spend my time. What do I do when I wake up in the morning? And you said, "Have you read The Dip by Seth Godin?" And I said, "No." And you said, "Well, let me summarize the book in a metaphor," which I assumed was from the book itself. And you said, "The book says." The longer you hold your breath underwater, the more interesting place you come up. Yeah. And uh, I then bought that book and I read it. And, <laughs> and nowhere in the book did that quote appear. And I was like, and I, I remember texting you. I was like, did you make that up? And uh, I told Seth that, that on chapter three uh, and, and he and, loved it. And, and I and I stole that from somebody else. I didn't, no. I, I didn't even make that oh, up. Here so. I've been giving you so much credit I know, for that. I know. And I'm going to take that credit. Ignore that. I, I totally made that up. <laughs> If, if you, if you, you like that metaphor, that was definitely mine. But I love it. The longer you hold your breath underwater, the more interesting place you come up. And yeah. I don't like it just because it's true, and, and I like it a lot. But but it's also because it is simplicity on the other side of complexity. Right. People right. are always entering and exiting a new job, entering and exiting a new relationship. And mm-hmm. that metaphor is a beautiful way to help people nice. not hurry into yeah. something else. Um, okay. Now, can we transition to your third and final book? I think we should. Which is called... An Imaginary Life by David Malouf. David Malouf. Did I say yeah, it right? You did. Okay. Um, David Malouf is Australian. He is. Born in 1945. And in 1978, in the United Kingdom, a publisher called Chateau and Windus published this book. It has the strangest summary of any novel I've ever heard of. In, and here's the summary. In the first century AD, Publius Ovadius Nasso? Yeah, or Ovid. The, <laughs> the, so the poet Ovid, which Ovid, is yes, you know, okay. one of the famous Roman poets. Yeah. Uh, well, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't know that, but I, I'm going to go with you. The most urbane and irreverent poet of Imperial Rome was banished to a, a remote village on the edge of the Black Sea. So all, that's, all, all, that's all of which is true. That's true. Yeah. From these sparse facts, Malouf has fashioned an audacious and supremely moving novel marooned on the edge of the known world, exiled from his native tongue, Ovid depends on the kindness of barbarians who impale their dead and converse with the spirit world. 
Then he becomes the guardian of a still more savage creature, a feral child who has grown up among deer. Yeah. What ensues is a luminous encounter between civilization and nature, yep. as enacted by a poet who once cataloged the treacheries of love and a boy who slowly learns how to give it. Tell us about your relationship with an imaginary life by yeah. David Malouf. So David Malouf is one of the great Australian authors. He hasn't written for a while. I guess he's getting on. But in the in the nineties, he was winning all sorts of famous prizes, like the Booker and the and the Irish Writer Prize and and the like. Yep. And D he, Dublin Literary Award. Thank you. And um, he is uh, all of his later books are kind of pretty hefty books, like three four hundred pages, and they're substantive and they're a bit like um, a, a bit like Patrick White, who's another very famous Australian author, the only Australian to win the Nobel Prize for Literature, kind of sprawling classics that tell of Australian life, particularly of um, the male, the Australian male life. But Imaginary Life is very, Maloof started as a poet, and Imaginary Life is in some way a transition book between poetry and, and prose, 150 pages, telling the story of, of Ovid, famous for his scandalous love poetry, and famous for his uh, series of poems called Metamorphoses. Which is all about change, right? All about yeah. evolution, all about growth. And and so we've already got something interesting to play with here because, I mean, I just was in a different context rereading about metamorphosis the other day. And do you know what happens with caterpillars and how they turn into butterflies? No. They grow wings. So They grow wings. That's That's kind of what you think, right? Which is like you get the caterpillar, it kind of gets into a chrysalis. And you kind of you're not quite sure what happens in the chrysalis, but there's basically an assumption that the caterpillar kind of you know unzips <laughs> its caterpillar suit, kind of shrugs out of it, takes the butterfly suit from off the wall, shakes it out a little bit, slips into it, zips it up, kind of gets comfortable, and then when it's ready, the chrysalis opens up and the butterfly flies out. That's not what happens. Here's what happens: the caterpillar gets into the chrysalis, and then it digests itself. It, it literally eats it. it. It dissolves in its own goo. And it just becomes a sludge. And it's, it's vanished, except for what they call imaginal cells. And imaginal cells are these kind of genetic cells that then rebuild the goo into a butterfly. I know, you've got a look on your face, which is exactly the look I've got on my face, which is like, what the hell? <laughs> Why did anyone tell me this? I know. It's, it's, it is mind-blowing. They skip over that in The Very Hungry Caterpillar. I know. They do. They just like, just eat, man. Um, so, so Ovid is a master of language. Like, he is the most urbane, the wittiest, the cleverest, the most skept cynical of poets. And he's in Rome, the heart of civilization. You know, that is the definition of civilization. What, what time period again? Um, like 1 BC okay. or something like that. So it's a Roman, it's, gl it's yeah. glorious peak. And then he's exiled and he's exiled beyond language. Why? Uh, because he wrote something that offended the emperor, emperor. You don't even hear about it. I mean, within the first yeah. few pages, he's, he's done. And he's exiled, uh, what do you mean beyond language? So he's been, he's, he's sent out to a village well, which talk. is in, yeah. uh, it's kind of in, I think, uh, Serbia now. So it's not black. Uh, yeah. Black yeah sea. By, on the black sea. Um, but he's like with the barbarians. The barbarians don't speak Latin. They they don't read poetry. He's like in a, he's in a muddy village of hunters who go. We don't know who the hell you are, but if you leave, we kill you, or you can't leave anyway because you're in a you're in a you know you're a frozen waste somewhere. And ostracized. And, well, not just ostracized, but but you have Exiled. lost. You've lost every marker of identity yeah. that you yeah. ever had. Wow. You are known for your wit. You're known for your language. You're known for your, your ability to be civilized. None of that is even understood in this new place. And what happens is he has to find a new way of seeing and appreciating the landscape. So as the book goes on, he moves from a going, this is hell, to I see the beauty of the landscape. And then he builds this relationship with a feral boy. So kind of like Mowgli a bit, like half wolf, half, half boy. And almost finds a new language to Who's talk. Ma Mowgli? So Mowgli is a character from Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book. Oh, okay. Um, 
we she's gotcha. now massively Disneyfied, yeah. so you may have seen the movies, but the original pieces, the, the boy who lives with the animals, the boy who lives with mm-hmm. the wolves and sees himself as a wolf. Um, and he, and it's this piece around him going beyond his intellect and beyond his language to fully immerse himself in the life around him. And the ending of the book, which is you assume kind of his death, because he's an oldest man when he's exiled, is this kind of sense of him, uh, an, a, an, epi, an epiphanic moment of him just kind of becoming and fading into the landscape. And I love that. Like, in some ways, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I, I am pre-exile Harvard, right? I'm an intellectual guy. I live in a city. I have you're urbane. I'm urbane. I have soft hands. You know, <laughs> I I pick up an axe and Your I and I blister. Not exactly. I'm like you know you leave, you allow me to try and live for myself in the in the wilderness. I'm dead within 48 hours. Um, and that ability to, at the same time, there's something I I have a very strong visceral response to the Australian landscape. That's why I've got this big tattoo of a Australian. Yeah, Michael's gum- pulling up his black T-shirt and showing me a huge tattoo on your bicep and shoulder mm-hmm. of like what looks like uh, three or four tree branches colored with yeah. like rainbow coloring and yeah. top- kind of like a topographical map type thing. Yeah. So for me, uh, these represent Australian gum trees, eucalyptus trees, oh. and they're, they're, they have this striation to them. And the and the coloring is partly about the gum trees, partly about my company box of crayons. But for me, it's very much a kind of a connection to landscape. That's mm-hmm. why I've also got the Southern Cross, which is the constellation you can only see yeah. in the Southern Hemisphere. You must miss that. I do. I, I miss it less on a daily basis when I'm here in Canada. But when I go back to Australia, I see it and I feel nostalgic. So you can't see the Dipper down, the Big Dipper you, down there. You can't see the Big Dipper. Oh. And and the Southern Cross is the is the go to constellation. That's is how is, you it, is it more famous as relatively than the Big Dipper down there? Nobody would know what you're talking about when you say the Big Dipper. <laughs> Nobody would, they're like, what? <laughs> I don't know what that is. In part because we're like, what's a Dipper? And a Big Dipper for us is like a carnival thing. You know, one of those big rides you go down? That's oh, what we know. We call those dipper. roller coasters. Yeah. So we, we probably, we may probably call it roller coasters too, but we also call them Big Dippers. Why do you, as such someone so urbane and sophisticated and intellectual, have such a deep connection to nature? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, but the book cover of this book is is not that dissimilar to your true. tattoo. It's, that's it's true. That's true. I've got a different cover because I've got a, I've got a, my book's 30 years old now. And signed by David Maloof. No way. In 1993. How'd you get that? Um... You know, I, at university in Australia, I actually ended up giving a paper at a conference about another book of his called Jono, which is another one of his... Don't early, tell me I read the wrong book again. No, you didn't. It's another one of his early books. And this is... Uh, the argument I was making is it's a, it's, a, it's a disguised autobiography. Anyway, David Maloof was actually in, in the conference. So I'm like trying to... You know, I'm giving this lecture explaining to David Maloof about his book. I felt like an idiot. <laughs> And and it, I'm not sure he totally agreed with that, but um, but he was nice enough to sign my book. What and did I'm he just, say? I just said to Michael from David, I think David David Maloof for Michael. But I'm also noticing that I apparently stole this from my high school. Oh, there's a stamp inside. Camber, Canberra? Camber Grammar School textbook hire. Please cover your book in clear plastic. If the book is lost or damaged, you must buy a new one to replace it. 1985. That's interesting. You know what? Um, uh, our chapter with Dave Barry, he said, here in Coral Gables in Florida, we steal books, damn it. And his point was that um, booksellers don't leave their cars locked. Right. Because even though there's books sitting on <laughs> the seats at all times, no one breaks in. All right. Well, this is a fascinating read. So what? why, like, what is up with, like, so what's the, who cares? Like, what's the, what's the so what on this book? So I, from, I, if I look at all three of the books that I've, I've picked, uh, let's say it's uh, Invisible Cities by Calvino and, um, and uh, A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson and then Imaginary Life. You know, one's, one's nonfiction, two are fiction. But all of them are disruptive yeah. of you taking your life for granted and kind of going, yeah, yeah, I get, I get what I see. All of them are saying... There's more to this world than what you're seeing at the surface and kind of holding yourself open to the 
what's amazing above it and beyond it and allowing yourself to open up and kind of just having the imagination to see the the many facets to this world. Yeah. That seems to be the thing. Were you that's atheist through. before you read these books? Did it, did it provoke you into, into atheism? I was, um, uh, you know, my, my, my grandparent, my, my parent, neither of my parents were religious, although they'd grown up in families where they went to church regularly, but I, you know, they never went to church. I mean, I, I then went to, this grammar school, which was normally an Anglican church. So I would go to chapel every Thursday. We had a very awkward moment where I'm called up as a 17 year old to re do the reading. So I'm, I, I'm like, okay, sure, whatever. And I start talking about this bad character in, in the Bible called Satan. No, no, Saturn. <laughs> and, <laughs> so anyway, that was my first taste of and humor. You call, you call and, him Satan. And, and I called him Saturn. So I'm like mispronouncing <laughs> Satan's name. <laughs> Anyway, I have the audience laughing, and I'm like, huh, I like this. You, know, maybe you did that on purpose? No, no, no. I did it by mistake. Ah. But I'm like, oh, because you and I know that I'm, I'm uh, later on this year going to do a stand-up comedy class. I was trying to get you to come and be part of it with me. And um, I was like, maybe that's where the seed got planted, which is like, actually, no, I've always been a performer. But uh, that was a reinforcement of going, hey, it's worth making them laugh, yeah. even if you're about to be struck down by God. It's a wow. small price to pay. Interesting. And you, you called these books disruptive on the sense of, of life appreciation and gratitude. I was thinking about it, um, you know, from a totally different perspective. You're a business guy. You run a, you run a very big, successful business. You wrote a book that's very successful in the, in the business space called The Coaching Habit. Before that, you wrote another book that was successful. Um, yet none of your influences are, are anywhere in the business world. I've heard you call, I've heard you say you don't like self-help before. And I, I, I think I even heard you refer to it as the self-help ghetto. Um, yeah. Like I'm, and you're, you mentioned that you're doing stand-up comedy now, uh, or you're training to become a stand-up comic. However, however that works. <laughs> like, what what is up with these intentionally kind of unique or unusual inspirations? Like, what what is this? What's the root of all of this? And uh, well, your book is quite different as well. Your business book. What, um, what, what's the deal? Well, I mean, that's a big. There's a lot of questions there. Um, and I couldn't come up with one, so I'm just going to say, and what else, until you tell me what something good. A genius. I see what you're doing there. Um, so I've there's a degree to which I seem to have just been wired early on to to try and zig when others zag, to kind of go, if that's the mainstream, what's the alternative to the mainstream? And um, But why? I don't know why. I mean, why? It's just, it's, you always want to do the opposite? I've always had a, I've always had a part of me that's kind of like, hmm. I mean, when I was, when I was, going for the road scholarship thing, which is a pretty much a kind of, you know, um, upper echelon mm -hmm. of the it's, society. It's the establishment, sort of not anti-establishment. Thank you. It's exactly. Um, but, you know, in the interview, I, I'm up against five or six other people, men and women. They're all wearing blue suits, white shirts, you know, pearls if you're a woman, a red tie if you're a man. I'm wearing a purple suit, a pink tie-dye tie, I have long blonde hair, which I've, you know, dyed. I've got multiple piercings. I'm kind of going, A, it's miraculous that I'm here. B, I'm only going to come a distant last place because I'm like, I'm just different from everybody else. Or I have a shot of winning it because I'm different from everybody else. And, um, and, I, and I just think there's something about uh, this is a special life we have. Bill Bryson, and and this is your one shot at it. Like in my in my books, you're not coming back. You don't get another go round at this. Um, I kind of buy into the whole Buddhist reincarnation piece, and that there's you know there's, there's, there's a closed system of matter. So eventually, you will be reincorporated. Your your atoms will be somebody else's atoms, but that's not going to happen for a while. <laughs> and it's not like it's your soul being reincarnated. It's just bits of matter. Um, so you like you got to make the most of this world. And you gotta you gotta squeeze the most out of it. I mean, have you read this? Uh, there's a, a great series of books that's wonderful about this. It's called the Book of Awesome. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> but it's true. That's what's that's so what's brilliant about that the the books. But uh, but for me, I got the I got the your work not through the books but through the blog post. And you're just like, who is this dude that just seems to take such delight in life? Right, and that's you. Well, I totally feel that way. I mean, it's um, 
we have. I've, I've lately, I don't know, I don't think I've told you this yet because it's been popping into my head lately. I've, I've actually become obsessed with the number 1,000. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you know this or not, but the average person lives 1,000 months. Huh. You are awake. Most people are awake for about 1,000 minutes a day. Right. Um, my first blog, uh, or the first one that did well, was 1,000awesomethings.com. Right. I thought that number was small, and then I started doing it, and I realized it was actually big. Like, it took yeah. four years to do it. But it was, importantly, attainable. Right. Big, but attainable. And so, for three books, it's 1,000 formative right. books spread over 333 chapters over 14 years. And to me, it's about... Yeah, taking taking every single day and moment and 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 conversation as if it's as if it's special and beautiful, which yeah. which it is. Yeah. But it's hard to do that, and you get caught in in the in the weeds in a the lot. In the grind, yeah. Yeah, and and you know, um, but you have somehow taken that manifestation, if I can call it, different is better than better. Yeah. The the, the purple suit wearing tie dyed yeah. long pink hair and piercing. I got the road scholarship, um, but you you also have a very unconventional lifestyle, right? Like you um. You are you you. What do you call it? You, you call it happily child free. I've heard you can't yes. call yourself say yourself. Or uh, I, or from the the new Incredibles movie. I don't know if you've seen Incredibles two yet, but Edna Edna, who's this great, edgy, funny designer, goes. I was never afflicted with parenthood. And yeah. I'm like, I love that. I know you're you and Leslie are on the cusp of no no uh, no 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 no. In, that's increasing your family, <laughs> but um, I'm like, I've I've been never afflicted with parenthood. But I love how you say that so confidently. Yeah. And also, I, I think you always told me like I don't own a home. Yeah, never owned a home. Never owned a home. No, we've always rented. Never owned a car. Never owned a car. And never owned a car. Never. Never, never owned a car. Do you have a driver's car. license? I have a driver's license. Never owned um, a car. Never owned a car. Bought my first ever appliance a year ago. So I'm 50, 51 or something. Uh, bought, I bought a washing machine because the washing machine in this place we rent, uh, it was just so terrible. And I'm finally like, you know what? I actually do most of the washing in my family. Um it would it will make my life better <laughs> to buy one. and I remember Tim Ferriss, you know, who I don't always agree with what he says, but he did have this question around how could you spend a thousand dollars to make your life better? And I'm like, buying a washing machine. And my wife is like, What is wrong with you? We rent. <laughs> yeah, we, we rent. We what don't are buy. you doing? And I'm like, honestly, I like going down and doing a wash now because I'm like, this washing machine still brings me pleasure. But that's my first How's the dryer? Uh, well, it's it's crappy, but don't, I don't, get, don't get addicted. Soon you'll be buying microwave ovens. Uh, I know, I know, but, but it's there. It's it's our landlord's dryer, and I'm fine with that. Okay, we've got a we've actually got a washing line at the back of our house, so we hang out most of our clothes most of the time. Wow, I know you're so unusual. That's the thing. It's um, it's a different is better than the better. Your books are unusual. The books you write are unusual. The way you structure your life is very unusual. Um, it's it's the most interesting. Like it, it just pops out. It's um. There, there is something about me never having wanted to just go. If this is the expectation, I should, I should do that, and uh, you know, and part of it's luck. I mean, and in Australia, I did a law. I studied a law degree, and once you're doing a law degree, it's very hard to not have the momentum of doing that. Have you turn you into a lawyer? Like most people do a law degree, and then like, well, I've just done four or five years of this, I'll do my articling, my college of law, which kind of qualifies you to be a lawyer. And then you're like, well, I've done that. So I might as well spend a couple of years being a lawyer. So then you do a couple of years being a lawyer and you're like, well, I don't love it, but um, if I do another couple of years, I'll be a associate partner. And then you're an associate partner and then you go, well, gosh, I'm just five years away from becoming a partner and that's where the money is. So, and then you become a partner and you're like, well, I'm now locked in as a partner and I've got a lifestyle that reflects that. And who knows, I could have got stuck into that. Winning the Rhodes Scholarship, I always say, did two great things for me. It stopped me becoming a lawyer. And uh, I met my wife as, at Oxford. I mean, I was leaving my law. I, I was being sued by one of my law lecturers for defamation <laughs> when I was um, at law school. So I probably, I may not have become a lawyer because it wasn't going that well for me. But um but you're well, right. Well, the unconventionality pops out in your Amazon bio, right? I've I've always wanted to ask you about this. I never have. It's um uh I'm gonna read it. Michael was banned. Oh, so here we go. An autobiography is only to be trusted when it reveals something disgraceful. A man who gives a good account of himself is probably lying, since any life, when viewed from the inside, is simply a series of defeats. Right. George Orwell. What a what a cynical quote. Um, and then here it is. Michael I like was, it. I like. I think it's a really human quote. Any life, when viewed from the inside, is simply a series of defeats. Do you believe that? I um, 
I think there's a there's a constant falling down, standing up, falling down, standing up. As like Samuel you, Beckett, right? As long as you include the the, the standing. Yeah, fair up, enough. Yeah, enough. yeah. Samuel Beckett, the um, it's like f- I f- can't move on. I move on. That type of thing. Yeah, I think his thing is like uh, fall down again, no matter, get up again, or some right. something like that. Yeah. Right. Michael was banned from his high school graduation for the balloon incident. What is that? So, what do you think it is? Well, when, when you when you speculate that, what do you think? The balloon incident. Um, did you throw a bunch of water balloons or something? Could have been. <laughs> was sued by one of his law school lecturers for defamation. I always thought that was a lie. No, no, it's true. Oh my gosh. Gave himself a concussion digging a hole as a laborer, mm-hmm. was fired on his first shift as a garage attendant, and has held a number of jobs where he had little to no impact. <laughs> That's all true. That's amazing, though. What, 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 a, what a way to build trust, though. Well, like, his, the number one piece of feedback I get on the yeah. show is, thank you for asking the dumb questions. Yeah. Well, part of it comes from, uh, you and I are both speakers, and so we've seen a whole bunch of other speakers. And so often when a speaker's introduced, they're like... They, they, there's this like two minute introduction that is in equal parts boring and intimidating, right? There's this long, long list of medals that they've won, you know, metaphorically or literally. And on one hand, you're like, I don't know what that is and I don't care so much. On the other hand, like, okay, so you're better than I am. Congratulations. And for me, part of um, What's your, is this your speaking bio as well, the one I so just read? It, the, a version of that. Yeah. Um, Maybe one or two good things at the end. Yeah. So I, I say, you know, Michael is a Rhodes Scholar and this, that, and the other. Balancing out these moments of triumph, Michael has blah blah blah. Because I'm like, I'm, I'm just normal. I'm just yeah. a normal guy who stumbled through life and got lucky in a few places. That's really hurting your speaking fee, I'm sure. Uh, I'm just joking. The, the 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 point is, I'm in service to the audience. So how is making me sound even? I'm already on the stage. I'm already being paid a lot of money. I already have the flip chart or the slide. I, I'm already in. I already have status. Yeah. Why do you need this bio to give me even more status? Yeah. You need a bit of a bio to give me credibility, so people go, "All right, that's worth listening to." But mostly people are going, "Please don't suck." And please be human. Like, don't be. Just give me. Be a nice, normal person and tell me something that's useful. So there's a deliberate diminishing of status by going, hey, laugh at my expense. Because it's pretty funny that I, I mean, there's the story of being a laborer. Like I'm digging this hole and um, I, I find this big rock. And I'm like, oh, so I, I dig my way all around this rock until I've now got a hole with this big, big rock on it. So I put the shovel up by the hole, reach down, keeping my back straight, using my legs, get my hands under the rock, lift the rock up kind of do a full body heave to throw the rock out of the hole. The rock hits the handle of the shovel. The blade of the shovel then flips up, hits me square across the, the head. I wake up sometime later. My my face is drenched in blood because, you know, scalp wounds bleed a lot. And I've had a, a shovel blade strike me across the head. I've been knocked unconscious in the hole. I climb out of the hole. And, no ah. one's there? Yeah, nobody's there. Yourself. I'm by myself. Um, I look like it. It's like it's like life of the living zombies coming out. I go up to the, the hospital sick bay place, and they're like, "Oh my god, what happened to you?" And it's like, in the end, it was a clean and relatively minor cut, but it was a pretty dramatic moment. Immortalized forever uh, with both confidence and humility. Yeah, my nickname on that job was "shit for brains." <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Have, I mean, I did not have a nice, a nice boss, oh. and I'd. Uh, <laughs> and and I'd for <laughs> yeah, and I dyed my hair orangey brown, so it was like this terrible color. And at one stage, my boss, really horrible man. I mean, racist, sexist, just awful. He said something to me, and I was, and I was like, "I'm the what?" And he said something. And I'm like, "Okay, I think I get what he wants." So I went and got the big trash can full of barbed wire and glass and nails and stuff. And took it and emptied it onto the back of his brand new truck. And he hadn't told me to do that at all. So what he's seeing me doing is taking all this scratchy stuff. And it's literally a brand new truck. He got it that morning. And I have, and, and he was going to build something over the back of the thing to protect it. And I've just, I've just destroyed. <laughs> I've just taken off $20,000 of value off his truck in a single act. <laughs> so, yeah, shit for brains. That's funny. <laughs> and, I feel like, yeah. and, and so the balloon incident. Yes. I oh, don't, you're actually going to reveal. I thought I, you were trying to tell me not to probe. Well, I'm not going to reveal it Aww. because it's it's a good it's a goodish story, but it's a better headline. 
So it's, it's actually more mysterious and more interesting for people to go, what is that? So if you, do you have comments on your, your, is there a way for people to comment on the, on the podcast? Um, I don't think so unless they do it on social media. So like on, on Facebook yeah. and Twitter and stuff like that. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe there's a way that. You're going to hide, you're going to hide an Easter egg. Like, yeah. It's like, yeah, if you. Okay. When I post this on Twitter, mm-hmm. you enter, you tell a little story in the in the in the comment reply, All and right. that's where listeners can go to find out what the balloon incident is. To both the listeners, <laughs> if you're like, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, you're, you're really not. There's uh, there's no one out there right now. Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> so it's just me. I'll I'll be listening, and I'll go. What is this balloon incident? It, it's it's an okay story, but it's a really good headline, and it's meant to. That's part of the other piece around bios, and in general, I always go. Rather than telling you stuff, how do I provoke curiosity mm. rather than mm-hmm. create certainty? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, growth mindset. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Carol Dweck. Yeah. Um, thank you, Michael. This has been a great conversation. I feel like we've gone all over the place. As yeah. I always... Literally, we've been uni- in the universe with Bill Bryson, Australia. We've been to imaginary, it... invisible cities. We've been to Italy. Amazing. Um Thank you so much for your time. It's a pleasure, Neil. Hey, everybody. It is just me. It is just Neil again, hanging out in my basement with my backpack full of wires, re-listening to that conversation with the incredible Michael Bungay's Danier. By the way, did anyone else hear a sneeze at the very end of the recording there? Like, he's like, it's a real pleasure, Neil. And then there's like a sneeze. But I'm like, that sneeze sounded really far away. So it wasn't me and it wasn't Michael. Who sneezed? That is a mystery (laughs) that I can't figure out. I don't remember sneezing. Huh. Where did that sneeze come from? There is a surprise, mysterious sneeze at the end of that conversation. I love talking to this guy. He gives me so many things to think about. It's so hard to pull quotes from this conversation. But here's a, here's three. I always like to do three if I can. Who doesn't need a bit more sparkliness in their lives? From the opening conversation about Christmas slash holiday slash everything lights. There's actually some profundity to that, don't you think? Who doesn't need a bit more sparkliness in their lives? And actually, from that conversation, I actually went and I talked to Leslie. And I was like, let's leave him up all year. Let's leave our non-Christmas lights, since they're no longer oriented to Christmas. They're oriented to our life being more sparkly. Let's keep them up all year. Another quote. Almost everything is going to be better the fourth time you write it. What a powerful way to communicate the effectiveness of hard work. Almost everything is going to get better the fourth time you write it. You might think you can ha- you know, slash off a really quick email, and you can, or a note or a letter, but if you write it again, it'll be better. If you write it again, it'll be a little bit better. And if you write it that fourth time, it will finally crack into great territory. Remember, Michael's whole work is around turning good to great, do more great work, right? That's one of his books. Um, and the third quote, which is kind of like they're two tied together, is well, I'm going to tie two quotes together. We are a ridiculously unlikely outcome when he was talking about short history of nearly everything, slash, this is a special life you have and you only get one shot at it, which I took inspiration from him telling us about just wearing purple shirts and tie-dye things to go to like the Rhodes Scholar interview. I mean, nobody would do that, but Michael did that. And of course, he got a Rhodes Scholarship out of it. This guy does zig when others zag, and it's just so beautiful listening to his mind work and giving us I'm so glad to have three new books on our top 1,000. As a reminder, if you go to threebooks.co slash the top 1,000, you will see a list of every single book thus far listed on the show, which will now, as of today, also include number 860, If on a Winter's Night, A Traveler by Italo Calvino. I don't know if we need to put an asterisk beside that because it was his fault that he gave me the wrong book to read. I didn't read the wrong book in that case, but still, I guess I read the wrong book because he was talking about imaginary cities a lot. But if On a Winter's Night, A Traveler for Now is on the list by Italo Calvino, followed by number 859, A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. 
and number 858, An Imaginary Life by David Malouf. Thank you so much to you, Michael. Thank you so much to you for listening to this right now. Thank you so much to all of you for helping to create this incredible three books community. Thank you so much, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Of course, that's not the end. Did you hit stop? Are you still here? If you're still here, well, I want to welcome you back to the end of the podcast club. Yes, this is one of three clubs that we have for three books listener. End of the podcast club, of course, is just people listen to the end of the podcast. I talk directly to you. You talk directly to me. I answer your phone calls, your letters. We have a word of the chapter. We have a lot of fun together. What else? Well, there is also the newly established Cover to Cover Club. This is for anybody that has listened to every single chapter of the show. There's now 48 of them. Are you part of the Cover to Cover Club? Do you have chapters that are missing? We need some sort of app or tracking mechanism for this. Maybe someone can send me some ideas on that. Please do. And the third club is, of course, our secret club. And I can't say much about it other than the way to get a little more info on joining the secret club is to call our phone number. Yes, it is a real phone number. Yes, you can call from anywhere in the world. And the number is one eight three three. read a lot So like we do every single chapter, let's start off the end of the podcast club by going to the phones. Hi, my name is Jennifer de Beaumont. I'm calling from Swansboro, North Carolina on the coast. Um, I just discovered your podcast today and ended up going way back to the Green episode and then listened just a smidge too long and heard the words pig bladder and went to the one right before that um, to hear about Little House of the Big Woods, which, of course, I knew that's what it was when I heard the word pig bladder. However, I do have one little quarrel um, when I was thinking about what my most worn Laura Ingalls Wilder book was. It was On the Banks of Plum Creek, which is the very one that was slightly disparaged so I just want to um, defend the honor of On the Banks of Plum Creek because I thought living in a dugout uh, home out of the side of the hill was super cool. Anyway, thank you so much for what you're doing. I love podcasts and I love books. And thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much to Jennifer from Swansboro, North Carolina, the coast of North Carolina, as you said. By the way, when I think coast of North Carolina, what do I immediately think of? I immediately think of chapter 18 of three books with David Sedaris, whose most recent book, Calypso, takes place in large part on the coast of North Carolina when him and his boyfriend, Hugh, buy a house. I think they name it the C-section, do they? Something like that. With the other Sedarises, including his 90-something-year-old dad. And hilarity ensues, some involving turtles, some involving tumors. Anyway, where were we? Jennifer, I should probably explain your comments for everybody else. The pig bladder reference that you are making is specifically from Little House on the Big Woods by Laura Ingalls Wilder, which was, of course, one of Gretchen Rubin's three most formative books way back in chapter, let me get the chapter right, chapter five of this show. One of her quotes was, uh, it, from that show, like, uh, oh, oh my God, like playing with a pig bladder. So fun. I want to play with a pig bladder, which is a hilarious quote of Gretchen to say. And you, I think, took umbrage, some umbrage that Gretchen must have. I do not remember this. I do not recall this. But Gretchen must have trashed a book called On the Banks of Plum Creek, an autobiographical children's novel also written by Laura Ingalls Wilder, published in 1937, the fourth of nine books in her Little House series. That book, On the Banks of Plum Creek, is based on a few years of Laura Ingalls Wilder's childhood when the Ingalls lived at Plum Creek near Walnut Grove, Minnesota during the 1870s. The original dust jacket proclaimed the true story of an American pioneer family by the author of Little House in the Big Woods. I don't remember Gretchen slogging that book, but I love the fact that you heard a snip of that and you were like, wait a minute, I love that book. And I'm going to call one eight three three read lot and let them give them the, give them you give you and Gretchen a piece of my mind. Thank you so much for doing that on the banks of Plum Creek. We've raised the profile of that book together now. Thank you. Now, it is time for our letter of the chapter. And for this chapter's letter, we're going to go over to JF underscore Renee. <laughs> I don't know the full name, but I guess it's JF underscore Renee who left a comment 
over on Instagram under a three books post. He or she or they write, Hi, Neil. In your podcast, you mentioned organizing your books by the Dewey Decimal System. Do you have a resource for finding where a book should be filed under that system? Sometimes my books don't have it listed, and I don't know where it should be filed! Exclamation mark. Thanks. Smiley face. Okay. Uh, I love a few things about this letter. The first being that you're organizing your books in the Dewey Decimal System, <laughs> and you need some resources to help you. And I have just the thing. I responded on Instagram, but I want to respond on the podcast as well. Um, and by the way, I, I'm super anti-social media. I've now got a system where I check social media one hour per week. I might talk about that another time. I've taken all social media apps off my phone. I know it's a necessary evil. At least it feels like that to me. For me as an author, I feel like I need to be on there, but I hate it. So I do it one hour a week. I mean, with codes and passwords, so I can't be on it the other uh, the other 167 hours of the week. But in the 167 hours a week, I get to make this podcast with all of you. So I'm still hanging out with you this way. Now, what did I say to Renee, to JF Renee? I said, yes, I do have a couple. Number one, first resource for Dewey Decimal system seekers out there. Bookmark this website. It is called classify.oclc.org. See it, that's classify, C-L-A-S-S-I-F-Y, classify.oclc.org. Okay, you go to that website, you type in the name, the title, author of any book, and sure enough, it tells you where the library holdings are kept. You click it, and it shows you how it is typically filed in Dewey Decimal System. Here's the thing. Dewey Decimal System is not an absolute filing system. It is open to inference, to opinion, to debate. So you might notice that like 3,000 of the filings, that's usually what I do, of one book, so 3,000 of the holdings, rather, at the library are, are held in, in one type of system, okay? Like 158.1 for... for um personal growth or development, but then there's another like 50 holdings of that book at the library that are filed in a different place altogether. They might be filed in like French biographies or something because it happens to be that that self-improvement book was written by a guy from France or whatever. Then you get to decide yourself where you want to file it for your Dewey Decimal System set up in your house, okay? I usually go with like where the majority of the book filings are. But as I said, that's resource number one. Again, as a reminder, it is classify.oclc.org. The number two resource that I recommend you have is an app on your cell phone called Decimator. That is spelled D-E-C-I-M-A-T-O-R. What is that app? It is the most detailed app I found, totally free, that, tell, that tells you the entire Dewey Decimal System. Okay, so if inside your book it happens to say, let's use the same example, 158.1, the reason I know it so much is because I click 1XX, because that's like, Oh, the 100s. Then I click the five, the 50s, one five, and then I keep going down, down, down until I find the exact number, and it tells me what it stands for. So in, inside of my books, I write down in pencil in case I want to erase, give, give away a book, sell a book, whatever. I, I like write it in pencil. I write down the Dewey Decimal number, Dewey Decimal system number in the top right of the first page, and then below it, I write the actual filing like place. Okay, so I write 158.1. I also write down personal or self improvement right below it. Those two resources are all you need plus a pencil. And then you too can file your books in the Dewey Decimal System. I recommend this, honestly. I know it's super nerdy. It was a fun Saturday to project to put together because I now know how my knowledge in my brain sort of sits and sifts. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I want that book. And I can so easily find it on my shelf. It's like, I know all the books on television are right around this part of the book. I know all the graphic novels are right around here. I know all the literature is all around here. Blah, 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 blah. It's awesome. And so every library in the whole world organizes their books for the most part. I know not every library because you're going to cite the Library of Congress, blah, blah. But anyway, I just love it. It's great. It works for me. If it works for you, high five. <sighs> okay. <laughs> and now it is time for the word of the chapter. And for this chapter's word, let's go back to Michael Bungay Stanier. The impact for me, and this is kind of why I like this book beyond the intellectual, because it kind of moves me. And I'm an intellectual guy. I'm more head than heart. So anything that connects to my heart, I'm like, that's pretty cool. Otherwise, it's a small wizened stone in my chest. Yes, indeed, it is wizened. W-I-Z slash Z, however you want to say that letter. W-I-Z slash Z, E-N-E-D, wizened. This is a word I have been using incorrectly and pronouncing incorrectly my whole life. Or at least since I had heard of the word. I thought it was wizened, first of all. I've read this in books a ton of time, and I thought it meant wise. I mean, that's what I thought it meant. But Michael used it in a strange way, and I was like, what is the definition of that word? Well, the definition is shriveled or wrinkled with age, like a wizened, weather-beaten old man. 
Okay, Merriam-Webster, are you going to confirm that from Google? Yes, to become dry, shrunken, and wrinkled, often as a result of aging or failing vitality. Okay. Uh, an example, let's go to Esquire magazine uh, and an article from January 18th, 2018. The title is Legendary Rocker Iggy Pop on His Personal Style. Here's the <laughs> in the article. But these days, Pop's torso, wizened from that er early stagecraft in seven decades on Earth, is more li likely to be found under the Miami or Cayman Island sun. Yes, Iggy Pop's torso is described as wizened. Turns out I am not the only person who thought wizened was pronounced wizened and had to do with wise. According to the blog Grammar Phobia, on March 23rd, 2012, this letter was received, and here's some of the answer. The answer is like a gigantic thousand-word answer, so I'll just give you some of it. The letter or the question says, this is from the actress Elizabeth Moss of Mad Men. She says, I started this show way more confident, way more wizened way more aware of the world around me than Peggy was, but over the years, she's cut up quite a bit. Wizened? Wow, she really started more shriveled than her character, and now they're both old and dried up? I wish these stars had grammar stylists as well as fashion stylists. So much negativity in that question. No book shame, no book guilt, people. If you can't pronounce the word, I don't know what a word means, that's a good thing. You can't make fun of the actress Elizabeth Moss for... um not knowing what it meant. Uh, she's not perfect, just like I'm not perfect, just like you're not perfect. Okay, but here's the answer. You're right. Elizabeth Moss, who plays the secretary-turned-copywriter Peggy on the AMC series, goofed during her March 8th, 2012 interview with New York Post, page six. She obviously meant wise, not wizened, but this is a mistake of usage, not grammar. The word wise means discerning, sensible, and sagacious, another word I don't know, while well, the adjective wizened means withered, shriveled, and dried up. The thing goes on to show that the word wizened first showed up in English in early 1500s, but it's derived from the older verb wizen, W-I-Z-E-N, or W-I-Z-E-N, uh, wisnian in Old English, which first appeared in the late 800s and meant, of course, to dry up, shrivel, or wither. Huh, there's a way to remember it. The adjective wise did not appear until the Old English poem Beowulf around the year 1000 according to the Oxford English Dictionary. I'm glad we got that settled. This has been a thorn in my side for the last two minutes, but we settled it here. We now know what wizened means, and that's why it is a perfect word of the chapter. So we've come to the end of another chapter, chapter 48 of three books. I so love this. I so appreciate these conversations. I feel it. I feel you. I feel your energy. I feel your letters, your phone calls, your connection. And even right now, when I'm in my basement in the back of the forest, I feel you. I feel like we're all hanging out together. This beautiful, growing, eclectic, interesting community of super interesting, nerdy, wonderful, beautiful people like us. So to close, I just want to say again, I feel it. I feel it. I feel this energy from you. And I think you feel it too. I think that's why you're here right now. I think that's why we're connected. Even though time, space, and distance try to come between us, they can't. Because right now our heads and our minds are connected through this right here, right now. Forget today. Life is short, as Michael said. But we right now are living in an eternal present I believe in you, I love you, and I'll always be here anytime you want to chat. Thank you so much for listening. Keep turning that page, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care, everybody.